In this third video about levels of selection, we'll be thinking about sexual reproduction. So first, let's think about how sexual reproduction works in diploid species. You have a female and you have a male, and they produce offspring. And so the, this offspring here has a genetic contribution from the mother, genetic contribution from the father. This offspring has a genetic contribution from the mother and a genetic contribution from the father. But if you think about this from the point of view of this female, if this male is just providing genes and then perhaps leaving and not providing other support, like raising these offspring, then this offspring that the mother is investing a lot of energy in, it's only half genetically her, half genetically this other individual over here. Maybe this female would be much better off just cloning herself and making offspring. It would be as much energy, but this offspring would have twice the genetic material that's the same as the mother's than these do. And so this is often referred to as the two-fold cost of sex. This female could have essentially twice the fitness from the gene point of view if she just cloned herself, right? These clones are fully related to her. So why is it that we see this so much? And why is it that species haven't just evolved where females just make clones of themselves and make more offspring? This would basically double their fitness instantly. So why not? It's not that this can never happen. It actually turns out that this is fairly easy to evolve. We see asexual reproduction in rotifers, lizards, sharks, dandelions, and a number of other organisms. Here's an example here. Here's a species of lizard, another species of lizard. They can actually hybridize to make this lizard here, which is diploid. And these lizards, turns out, they can just lay eggs that develop into perfectly good, reasonable other adults. And they can actually also hybridize with this other species here and make other triploid individuals here. But the key thing being, this hybridization produces individuals here that can clone themselves. And this isn't a real organism, right? This is a lizard. This is a vertebrate like us. It's not like evolving from a sexual organism into an asexual organism is impossible or some sort of constraint that we would expect to exist and limit evolution. It's the sort of thing that appears to be possible all the time. And so selection at levels of both the gene and the individual would favor asexual reproduction. It's actually, even if you just ignore the fact that these individuals have twice the genetic material of the mother, the mother doesn't have to go through the trouble of finding a male and dealing with a male and incurring all those costs that the other sex generates. She can just do all her reproduction herself. So selection at both level of gene and the individual would seem to favor asexual reproduction. So why is it that most organisms use sexual reproduction when this cost exists? So disadvantages of sex, hard to find a mate, as we mentioned, and this twofold cost. But there are three big advantages of sex, which we'll look at in a bit more detail. First of all, having sex increases the variation of the offspring. Right, with asexual reproduction, individuals make a bunch of clones or make individuals that only have their alleles. Sexual reproduction allows the offspring to be more variable. Sexual reproduction also speeds the rate of evolution of a population by allowing independent beneficial alleles that maybe arise in different individuals to be combined into a future descendant. And then thirdly, sexual reproduction allows the removal of deleterious alleles from a population by recombination. We'll look at these in more detail in just a minute. But one thing to note is the disadvantages to sex are all two particular individuals, right? But the advantages are to populations, right? So the persistence of sexual reproduction is actually going to arise because in this case, for this trait, group selection is going to be more powerful than individual level selection, which is something that in general we don't usually see. Okay, the first advantage of sex is sex increases the variation of the offspring. And this can actually be both good and bad. So let's think about a scenario here where the capital A allele is the better allele, the lowercase a allele is the worse allele. Right, so this would be advantageous, this would be deleterious. These homozygotes have the best genotype, these homozygotes have the worst genotype, and the heterozygotes are intermediate. So if we think about the sorts of matings that can occur, 
a capital A homozygote can either mate with another capital A homozygote, in which case all its offspring have the capital A homozygous state, so that's good. The capital A homozygote could mate with a heterozygote, in which case half of the offspring are as good as they are, but half are actually worse. And if a capital A homozygote mates with the lowercase a homozygote, in fact all the offspring are worse than this individual. So sexual reproduction for this genotype is actually bad because it's going to cause them to have heterozygous offspring that are worse. So sex in this situation is actually bad for these homozygotes. On the other hand, lowercase a homozygotes, if they mated with the same genotype, all their offspring have that same bad genotype. But if they're able to mate with a heterozygote, half of their offspring are better than they are. And if they're able to mate with the other homozygote, all of their offspring are better than they are, or better than they would be if they had cloned themselves. So sexual reproduction actually causes these individuals, this bad genotype, to actually have better offspring, to do better than if they were asexual. And then the heterozygous individuals, it's kind of a wash. Heterozygous individuals reproducing with themselves or cloning themselves, they would make other heterozygotes and then make some better, some worse. If they mate with the better genotype, their offspring are a little bit better. If they mate with the worse genotype, their offspring are a little worse. So the interesting thing about sexual reproduction is it's actually bad for the best individuals and it's good for the worst individuals. But the net effect, if you just look at the individual point of view, is a wash, right? Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse than self-reproduction. So from the point of view of the individuals, sexual reproduction isn't guaranteed to be better, but it could be better for a population, especially if the environment varies. So say this genotype is actually better in high temperatures, this genotype is better in low temperatures. Well, when it's warm, this is the best genotype. When it's cold, this is the best genotype. And by maintaining variation in the population, which sexual reproduction would do, then if the environment changes from hot to cold, the population will have individuals that can do well in that environment, and the population can persist. Whereas if it didn't have sexual reproduction and everybody was this genotype, when the environment changed from hot to cold, maybe the population would go extinct because they wouldn't have any of the genotypes that although they're bad in the hot environment, would be good if the environment changed to be cold. So sexual reproduction can be very important for the long-term survival of populations, because it maintains variation, but it doesn't really provide a consistent benefit to individuals within those populations. Second advantage of sex is that sex speeds the rate of evolution of a population, allowing independent beneficial alleles to combine. So we have two diagrams here. This axis is kind of representing proportion of the population that has a number of different genotypes. And here, the top one, we're thinking about an asexual population. So everybody has some sort of default genotype here. The capital A, capital B, and capital C alleles will be novel beneficial alleles. So the population is kind of moving along, and then there's a mutant here that has the capital A allele, and they're doing better, right? So the frequency of individuals with the capital A allele will increase over time. At this point, now there's a mutation that creates capital C individuals, and they start to increase in frequency because they're better than whatever was here before. And then a little later, the B mutation also occurs, and those individuals increase. But at this point, although the population has all three alleles, they're now competing with each other, right? Because reproduction is asexual. And only one of those alleles can be the one that wins. And as this allele A wins and increases in frequency, it's actually going to push the other good alleles out of the population. And now the population is better, right? Because everybody has the capital A allele. And then in a capital A individual, the capital B mutation could occur again, perhaps, creating these double beneficial mutants here. The capital C mutation could occur, creating these double beneficial mutants here. And again, now they're in competition with each other, both the B and the C alleles increasing in frequency, but they're competing. Only one can win. This one would win. And then later on, those individuals can get that third beneficial mutation again until finally you get a state here where the population has all three beneficial mutations. So it takes a while, and it has to basically happen in three waves for a population to go from the initial state to the state with three beneficial alleles. On the other hand, if you have sexual reproduction, then these mutations that are starting here and occurring here at the same time that they were here, okay, that first capital A allele occurs, those individuals are doing better, they're increasing in frequency, 
This capital C allele arises, and these individuals are doing better, they're increasing in frequency. Capital B allele arises, those individuals are doing better, increasing in frequency. And now with sexual reproduction, this individual can actually mate with this individual and produce individuals with both mutations as a result of sexual reproduction. And the same thing here. And now you've got a population with individuals with two mutations that are beneficial. These individuals have two mutations that are beneficial and they can actually mate with each other and you can actually produce these individuals immediately that have all three beneficial mutations from the very first instance of their arising. And then this genotype is better than all the other ones. It increases in frequency and takes over. And so you can see that population achieve this state of three beneficial alleles much more quickly when mating and recombination to combine these alleles into the same individual can occur, that happens much faster than when it can't occur. So again, this population is actually doing better than this population because of this sexual reproduction. But it's not necessarily true that any individual is doing better. So for example, here, in fact, these individuals are getting extinguished from the population more quickly because of sexual reproduction. So the benefit here is again to the population rather than any particular individual within that population. And then our third advantage of sex is um, that it will allow the removal of deleterious alleles. It prevents something called Muller's ratchet. So the idea behind Muller's ratchet is imagine that you have a population here and these bars are indicating kind of the number of individuals and this is the number of deleterious alleles that they have in their genome. So you start off a population, the typical individual has like three or four deleterious alleles. There are some that have none, so they're the best off, right? They have no deleterious alleles. And then there are some really gimpy individuals that have like seven deleterious alleles. So the population is like this. Mutations occur every time there's reproduction, there's a certain chance that individuals get deleterious mutations. So say there's on average one deleterious mutation per genome per generation. Well, after one generation, this set of individuals here will produce a set of individuals here. And now the best individual has a deleterious allele. And with asexual reproduction, and if mutations are generally deleterious, well this population is stuck, right? The best individual now is worse than the best individual before. And then another generation on, now these guys are all worse, right? So actually the best individual here is worse than actually quite a few of the individuals just two generations earlier. So with asexual reproduction, this is a one-way trip. Every generation, the population is taking an irreversible step to have more deleterious alleles. So that's why this is called Muller's ratchet. Muller thought of this, and a ratchet is a tool used in mechanics or fixing cars where it can move one direction, but it can't go back. So with asexual reproduction, you basically have a ratchet where the population will build up deleterious alleles, and it can never go back never can generate individuals that actually are as good as they start off. On the other hand, if you had sexual reproduction, then once you have this population, this individual that has one deleterious allele, it could mate with another individual that has a deleterious allele. And when their gametes are produced, maybe they'll, they'll make some sperm or eggs that carry those deleterious alleles, but maybe they'll make some sperm and eggs that don't carry those deleterious alleles. And when they mate with each other, as long as they have different deleterious alleles from each other, they have the capability to produce an offspring that actually has no deleterious alleles. The mother has a deleterious allele at locus 5, and the father has a deleterious allele at locus 7. They may be able to mate, and a quarter of their offspring, if you think about the Punnett square, would actually have no deleterious alleles at either 5 or 7, assuming the parents are heterozygotes. So sexual reproduction would actually allow these individuals to produce better individuals that aren't kind of being ratcheted along. And you can imagine that say the environment was such that if you have eight mutations, you die because you can't keep up with some sort of predator or environmental condition. Asexual reproduction pushes the population along and every generation is pushing individuals into this death zone and there's no way to prevent it, right? So the population will only last eight generations. But with sexual reproduction, as long as these guys are reproducing, Okay, maybe they're making individuals here that actually have more deleterious alleles, but they're also capable of making individuals here that have fewer, so the population can actually keep generating individuals 
that don't hit some sort of threshold of mortality. So sexual reproduction, again, it's not necessarily good for any individual, because when these individuals mate, they could actually produce offspring that right off the bat have two deldeers alleles plus the one for mutation. But they have the capability of making these, and it's going to be equal numbers of each. So for an individual doing reproduction, sexual reproduction is just as likely to make a worse offspring as a better offspring. But the population as a whole is capable of making individuals that are better than previous generations. So these three arguments for the advantages of sexual reproduction, they actually all show that sex is good for the group, but is not actually consistently good for any of the individuals within that group. So the persistence of sex would appear to be due to group selection instead of individual level selection. Support for this group level selection comes from the fact that when we look at asexual species, they're generally very young. They haven't been around for very long, so those groups haven't actually lasted very long because perhaps group level selection has eliminated groups that have been around longer. The only ones we see are recent ones. The only exception to this is rotifers, and they have very large populations, which can act as an insulation against processes like this, as we'll see in the next part of the course. And this is actually essentially the only widely accepted case in which group level selection really beats out individual level selection. And so it turns out that when we're thinking about adaptations, adaptations are almost always explainable by gene or individual level selection, and we know those processes exist, and we have lots of cases of those. And so when we're thinking about adaptations, the concept of parsimony, this idea of cheapness or Occam's razor, right, not using extra things to come up with explanations, but using the minimum amount of explanation, the principle of parsimony removes our need to talk about group selection, especially since we know group selection is almost always not as good as individual level selection, sexual reproduction being the only real counterexample that's widely accepted. Because we know that gene level selection and individual selection are effective, and group selection typically isn't, when we think about adaptations, the best way to think about why things have evolved is to think about it strictly in terms of how it would be good for genes that provide those traits, or how it would be good for individuals that have those traits. And it is, in fact, a bad idea to think about how something has evolved because it would be good for the group that has that trait. When we think about these different levels at which selection may occur, selection at the level of the gene and selection at the level of the individual are the levels at which selection mainly acts, and almost all adaptation can be understood best by focusing on these levels. Selection at the level of the group is really only useful for thinking about the evolution of sex, although we did see in the T locus there was some influence of group level selection, but in general, evolution of sex is the only really good unambiguous example of group level selection being vital. And then we can even move up into other groups like species, and you do see some people talk about how there are species clades, like some groups of species do better, like insects seem to do better than myriapods, mollusks seem to do better than onychophrons. But the further up you go, the more kind of speculative things are getting, and the less support there is for selection acting at these levels or these levels versus these levels for which we have lots of support and evidence.